I'm Fred Fishkin at the fifth annual Princeton Smart Driving Cars Summit. We've had a very full day in the city of Trenton, in West Windsor, and in Princeton, showing off a May Mobility autonomous vehicle that you see right here. And with us is the CEO and co-founder of May Mobility, Ed Olson. Great to see you, Ed. Great to see you. Well, give us a little background to start with of May Mobility uh, and where you're operating today. Yeah, so May Mobility was founded in 2017, and it's the third major autonomous vehicle effort that I've been uh, been working at after uh, DARPA Urban Challenge at MIT, Ford, at Toyota Research Institute. Actually, it's the fourth one, uh, May Mobility. And we've really applied a lot of what we've learned from these other AV efforts to how do we build a vehicle that can go and work with transit in a really unique way. So we've got different technology, a different go-to-market, and some really great partnerships. Well, tell us where you're operating now. Uh, five cities right now. Uh, see if I can rattle them off. Um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, Arlington, Texas. This gets harder all the time. <laughs> you're in Japan, too, I understand. Higashi Hiroshima, Japan. Yes, absolutely. And we've, we've learning to drive on the right, drive on the left, um, dealing with lots of different kinds of traffic patterns. So from what you heard today in the in the city of Trenton, we were at a, a public housing project, various locations, city hall. Tell us, and the State Department of Transportation, tell us what you heard today that you found encouraging. I think that uh, Trenton is a lot has a lot of the same challenges that other cities have. That there are places that are transportation deserts or where people don't have uh, personally owned cars. And in the way that we build cities in America, it's really hard to get around if you don't have a car. And so public transit, I think, can be the solution to that. But we need to be able to get the transit to the people who need the services. And I think that vehicles like this can provide the right size transportation solutions that can have a huge impact on the way that people live. Describe what your vision is, how this would work for people in, in, in the city of Trenton. I mean, we're talking things like kiosks. Yeah, so, so I, maybe I'll turn it as a question back to you. Most of the time when you see a bus driving around, how many people are on the bus? Very few, very often. Uh, that, that's right. And, of course, there are some buses that work fantastically well, where you've got the population density and the demand structure where a bus makes a ton of sense. Our, our view is keep those buses. But in places where you've got buses driving around uh, that aren't carrying very many passengers, we think you can do better with a a larger number of smaller vehicles that can literally drive circles around that bus on a fixed route. These vehicles can go point to point on demand, taking people from where they are to where they need to go. And with that, we can reduce the average wait time, we can reduce the average trip time, and make the, the experience of using public transit much, much better. And the idea is to provide equitable and, and affordable, safe transportation to people. The question that, that a lot of people might have is, okay, something like this, I'm looking at the equipment on board. This is really expensive to build. How does this work out as a business in being able to provide affordable transportation? Well, one of the most expensive things uh, on a vehicle like this are the sensors. And we've been very deliberate in designing this vehicle to have a bill of materials that is manageable and sustainable. So we actually run a profitable business on our sites. And that's by being really smart about what sensors we put on the vehicle, how we operate them, and getting really smart about reducing overheads and other unnecessary costs. Now, uh, my uh, co-host and and colleague, Alan Kornhauser, likes to say that the, the cost of all of this equipment and the software goes down to zero, and it may not be quite zero, <laughs> but it becomes not zero. <laughs> but it becomes, <laughs> but it does become very affordable over time. How quickly can that happen? Do you think? I mean, so many of us have seen the five thousand dollar flat screen TVs now costing two hundred dollars in the Costco. That's right. Uh, so I think we all you see a range of guesses. So on, on the one hand, you've got Mobileye saying that by 2025, their ADK will cost $5,000. That is an extremely aggressive cost curve that they're, they're talking about. We're, we, we're a little more conservative than that. We don't think costs are going to come down quite that fast. But I do agree that the costs are going to come down. They're going to come down fast as the volumes ramp up. Now, from a business perspective, I think that those are that's going to uh, be that's going to be a good combination for us. That the volumes increase really rapidly, we can still have a great business even if the revenue per vehicle goes down a little bit. And some of the partners that you're working with, uh, one of them, 
is the maker of this vehicle, Toyota, right. right? Yeah, this this vehicle is actually really a special vehicle. This is one of the first vehicles that's ever been made to have a native autonomous driving capability built into it. So auto-grade drive-by-wire designed by Toyota with May's autonomous driving stack powering that. And this is really one of the huge steps that you need in order to build and scale these vehicles. Ultimately, we don't want to build four of these or 10 of these. We want to build thousands of them. And so have, being on this roadmap where we can talk about leveraging Toyota's manufacturing capability to turn these things out by the thousands is really exciting. And this, this vehicle represents some of the first auto-grade vehicles. Tell us what advantages you feel you have over your competitors in this space. Alan has said there are maybe seven or eight companies capable of providing mobility services. Yeah, I think there's really three things that differentiate May. Our, our technology, our go-to-market, and the partnerships that we bring to the table. On the technology side, this is my fourth autonomous vehicle stack. And we've really gone about building the te- technology in a very different way than the way other people are building technology. What, how, how is it different? So the big challenge is you've heard about edge cases, and everyone's out chasing millions of miles to catalog all the edge cases. Well, I, over three previous efforts, I've come to the conclusion that that just doesn't work. The critical thing that you need to build an autonomous vehicle that works is a vehicle that can handle an unusual situation the first time it encounters it. To do that, you can't rely on rules. You can't rely on on having somewhere in your training set seen something similar. The vehicle has to be able to imagine what would happen if the vehicle did this or did that. And so our technology is based on allowing the vehicle to choose from a number of different driving strategies at any moment in time, leveraging simulation that's going on in the vehicle live. So everyone does simulation offline to validate. We're doing simulation live as we're driving around. So the vehicle is making decisions based on thousands of seconds of simulated futures. Now, besides Trenton, we saw senior citizens in West Windsor. We saw the the mayor of Princeton. And all of them expressed great interest in in what you're doing. Many had questions Hmm. about, you know, how, how this can safely be deployed, et cetera. But some of the seniors, it was interesting, were asking, when can you start? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a valid question. So how quickly do you feel like uh, the Trenton Move system could be deployed if, in fact, you were chosen as the one to operate it? Yeah, so I think one of the, the key questions that you're getting at is, is, is there how hard will adoption be? And what we have learned over and over from our previous deployments and from those, those conversations is that if we can solve a real transportation problem, a need, then adoption comes very quickly. In terms of how fast it takes us to get vehicles on the road, we've deployed vehicles in as little as a few weeks doing an initial mapping and validation. Uh, for a, a large-scale commercial project, we'd look for you know several months. So it wouldn't be out of the question to say by the end of next year, for instance, Not that there the could be mobility. Yeah, absolutely. Very exciting. And, and were you encouraged by what you heard from the people today. It wasn't just the officials, it was the people. Ultimately, the people are why we do this. So I, I'm, we, we really do believe in building transportation systems that improve equity and access for people. And that includes people who don't own personally owned vehicles, people who are don't have a driver's license yet or maybe shouldn't be driving anymore. Uh, we've t- t- spoken to a lot of people like that today. And it's really exciting to imagine these vehicles really improving their, their quality of life. And, of course, we're talking about a few communities here in New Jersey, but there's a much broader picture, places that you're already operating in and so many communities where, the, where there's a need around the United States and other countries as well. I think the, the vision for us is that by deploying these vehicles in larger numbers, we can start to change the way that cities are literally built and change the way that people experience cities. If you think about a, a city like Ann Arbor or, or Trenton, so much of the space is parking or roads that are wider than they really need to be. And that's expensive for the city. It uses a lot of resources. It also tends to make cities less walking friendly and less friendly to bicyclists. So the future that we see is one where we not only getting people where they need to go in autonomous vehicles in an on-demand way, but a city that's more beautiful and more vibrant and more economically sustainable. You know, car makers, including Toyota, for decades have been telling us how much fun it is to drive their cars, getting us to want to drive them, 
It's so exciting. It's on the beach. It's on the mountains. It's every place. <laughs> How do we change the mindset, the mindsets of the public, that they don't need to own a car? I think we're already seeing a pretty big shift generationally about the desire to own a car or even to get a driver's license. The the average age at which people are getting driver's licenses is increasing quite rapidly. And I think that's that's really teasing apart uh, that, that people are viewing cars as serving two different purposes. There's the utilitarian aspect of how do I get from point A to point B? How do I get to my next appointment? Uh, and then there's maybe a recreational component for some people. But I think increasingly those are two different two different things. And we, we think we can solve the utilitarian part while people who want to have fun in a car can still go to the track or, or find places to do that. Alan will be back with us shortly, but in case he's not, you're likening this to an elevator. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think uh, we're, we're seeing a new technology. It's disruptive. Elevators change the way that we build buildings. And autonomous cars are going to change the way that we build cities. Terrific. Ed Olson, thank you for taking time with us. Where's the best place for people to go for more information? Maymobility.com is a great place to start. But one of the things I'm really proud of is that these vehicles are not research R&D vehicles that you need a special permission to go and ride. These are vehicles that are open to the general public. Go and ride our vehicles. Go and visit us. Experience autonomous technology and let us know what you think.